Okay, so this was a trauma case. Um, and I'll skip the chest slices, except we'll start with the lower chest slices where the finding is. So patient came in being hypotensive and in shock. He'd already been seen at an outside hospital. So there's a chest tube there. And then we definitely saw the hemothorax. And on lung windows, there's pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum. But I'll keep scrolling through these images and see if you pick up other stuff. Window it a little. And I have a venous phase also to show. So the pertinent findings are only on these images. Is there also heart in like, I mean, is there air in the um, heart? Like yes, there is pneumopericardium. Just yeah, see. and then go down a little bit more. Is there blood in the pericardium? Right. So. Oh, the there's contrast phase. in the pericardium. Yes. So I'll show you the venous phase. And then do you see the little defect here? Yeah. So this was a big um, tear at the junction of the IVC and the right atrium. It was a shear injury is how they described it. So they found like a three centimeter tear of the posterior wall of the right atrium. And this was like a contained right atrial rupture. I've never seen anything like this. The things that threw me off were there was not a whole lot of pericardial effusion. Um, patient was hemodynamically unstable. So they opened him up thinking they were gonna find something in the hemothorax. But then they said, even after they fixed or ligated the intercostal that was bleeding, he remained hypotensive. So because they saw pneumopericardium, they decided to do a sternotomy. And the minute they opened the chest, they said there was a gush of blood that came out and they found this defect in the wall of the atrium at the junction of the IVC. So when you read about it, they say not many patients with this type of injury actually survive to make it to imaging, which is why we don't see many of these. There's hardly any much in the case uh, reports in the literature. But other points to look for with IVC injuries are where the IVC gets really close to the vertebral body. It can get fixed between the liver and the vertebral body and it can have a shear injury here. So those are two common places right here and then where it enters the right atrium are tether points and high risk for shear injuries. So this is a right atrial injury with like a contained tamponade, I guess. And you said the patient did okay? He's actually doing okay. As of today, he's he still made it. So, Wow. I know. Very unusual. I'd not seen a cardiac injury like this. In, yeah. And in, in patient who made it, right? Um, so this is my case. And um, Rupa was just saying that there was something in, abnormal in the lower uh, left paramediastinum, which there is a calcified um, ectatic aorta here. Um, but, and then also going down into the abdomen, we can see some calcification here. We'll just show you, this was, um, the patient a few months earlier, and you can see that, I don't know, the calcification is not as prominent here, but the, probably the aorta is going over here and the calcification down here is, um, is more medial. So, just going back to now, um, one of my astute colleagues on this sort of more contrasty algorithm noticed also that there's even calcifications even more laterally here. And they said, you know, this, this looks like a new finding, all of these sort of deviated calcifications and this one, this new one, and we'd recommend a CT. And they did a, a CT and here I'll show you. Um, so as we go down, we can see that the aorta is very, very ectatic. There was a dissection and actually it had ruptured. And so those um, displaced calcifications um, were a sign of the rupture. Um, so, and then here we can see that there's hyperdense blood uh, going down into the 
in the pelvis. Um, so it was just to me a good reminder, like, you know, these plain films often there for like a feeding tube. You're just kind of looking at these things, but, um, you know, these calcifications are, you know, if you have a triple A, they're at generally increased risk of rupture. And if you could be the person who could pick up, you know, that the, the calcifications have moved over time, they're displaced and that this is a sign of rupture. Nice. This patient survived too, I think. Um, no, unfortunately. Okay. Did not, no. okay. Nice plan. And was um, slightly older patient, extensive cardiac history. They had had mitral valve replacement that got complicated with endocarditis. Then they had some kind of, of pericardial tear and pericardial effusion, which they did a patch repair. Um, so they've been in the ICU for a long time and the present study was being done to evaluate for GI bleed because they had some drop in their h, &H. So I'm showing you the venous phase. I'll come back and show you the arterial, but there was no real GI bleed, but there was one other finding which was significant. That right colon looked abnormal. Okay. Um, let's see. I presume those were ingested hyperdense things, yes. but then it looked almost like perf perforated, contained perforation. Right. Yeah. So very nicely seen on coronals, actually. So there's the wall of the colon, and then suddenly we see it decompress into the abdominal wall with air outside the lumen of the colon. So this actually ended up being ischemic cecum and ascending colon. They said when they opened the cecum, they found multifocal areas of mucosal friability. It was dusky and non-viable. So they actually ended up doing a right hemicolectomy. So something to remember in these sick and ICU patients, they're often hypotensive. So they get um, ischemia more easily than we think, even though there's no major arterial occlusion or anything. Thing. It's just hypotension induced. Uh, this was the follow up scan where that perforation was still there. And at this time, the appendix was even inflamed. So they went to surgery soon after this. But I think reformats are important. We've talked about this when we run the bowel. We should always look at reformats. So it's a good reminder to look outside and follow the contours of the wall. Yeah, also, um, it's an interesting location because. We think about the watershed being sigmoid right, at the junction and, right? and yeah. splenic flexure. Yeah, this was at the cecum ascending junction, so unusual, yes. And enhancement wise, I don't think prospectively we could have called it ischemic or anything, right? I, I, I felt like reading the op note, they described it much more dramatic than we're actually seeing it. I think we're also in such a late phase that, like, not a lot of the other bowel is enhancing as much, but. Maybe yeah. So. yeah. Okay, so this was a youngish patient. Um, you can see they have just some simple, multiple simple cysts in their liver, and the finding is actually down in the pelvis. Is here. They had had a hysterectomy. Hard to tell if some of it is bowel RT, but it looks like a cystic mass. Yeah, so it looks like a cystic mass with Neural solid margins. components. Yeah. A big solid component, actually. Yeah. It looks like it's coming from the ovary. That was what we initially, or, or whoever read this outside film thought. So whenever we think about the ovary, we can follow like the gonadal veins. So we're following these gonadal vessels down. See if we can see if it lands in the mass. Oh, and I don't, I don't necessarily see a separate ovary. No. Um, however, and the, and the veins do kind of like go into this area. Um, I guess just in retrospect, now that I know what the diagnosis is, you can also kind of see that there's like small bowel going into this mass. So like a gist. 
Yeah. So this this went to the OR as a presumed ovarian cystic neoplasm and came back as a gist of the small bowel. And I would say, like, in retrospect, you know, just it is affiliated with so many of these bowel loops. I'll give you a coronal. Um, you can see that these it has this really big interface with the small bowel here. Um, and it also has kind of, you know, it's very cystic, but also like a big, big solid component. I mean, this still could have been an ovarian mass, but just in retrospect, you can see this big interface here with the small bowel. Um, so this turned out to be a small bowel gist. Um, they have a worse prognosis than gastric gists. Um, they often have a cystic or necrotic component, um, big solid component. If they're kind of, anytime you see like a large mass in the mesentery or in the abdomen, you, you know, just keep gist in the back of your mind. It can arise from anywhere, most commonly stomach, um, less commonly small bowel and colon, and then very rarely you can get extra intestinal gist. So just rising from pacemaker cells in your mesentery, not attached to any bowel loop, but just, um, just arising from the mesentery. So anyway, this was a cute little gist. Um, I guess it prospectively, we had realized that with like, you know, the vessels going from the small bowel into this, um, they might've considered giving Gleevec because it was pretty big. They could have shrunk it down. 90% um, of gists are responsive to Gleevec, so. Nice, also for ovarian, we've, we've had a similar case to where we called something ovarian, but it ended up being a gist. And the teaching point on that too was for such a big complex looking ovarian mass, there's no, ascites, no regional nodes, no mental caking, nothing. Yeah, very good points. No, yeah. no peritoneal nodularity, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Cool. So uh 71 year old female and and I'm just scrolling. It's a non-contrast study. Just it's a quick uh, case. Oh, wow. The ureter is like inserting on the vagina. <laughs> prolapse. Yeah. And massive prolapse. Yeah. So basically there is massive prolapse as you can see here. Let me pull up the, okay. You can see that this is a massive prolapse and uh, the bilateral Ureters are dilated. There's a hydronephrosis. And the reason for this uh, hydronephrosis is just this prolapse. Wow. Can you zoom in on the axial for a sec? Sorry. I'm trying to understand why. Um, okay. And then back down. So is it just being dragged? And yeah, dragged. it's being dragged. Yep. So I was, like, I was like completing it with the vagina there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Nice. So, yeah, that was I that hydro was very... from prolapse, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so now you're going to show us how to draw the M line and the H line, <laughs> 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 which I always have to like bring the article back up to remember how to do. So, look at this. Me, I don't know if I can even draw it. <laughs> everything is below the. <laughs> it's everything, yeah. <laughs> is there also a lipoma in the colon there? Nothing is just oh, that in the sigmoid, sigmoid, right there. Yeah. Anyway, probably just some fluid or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Nice. Twenty something week old pregnant patient, and it's kind of a show and tell case. We've seen two variants of this before. So I'll show you her old scan and I'll show you, this is her present scan. So what do we think? Wait, of is this like the trapped uterus? Mm -hmm. right. Like it's, it's like flipped in front of the bladder. Yes. So there's bladder, yeah. this is cervix and the entire uterus is anteriorly incarcerated. So look at the position of the baby on this scan. So this is um, breach. So this is her previous scan. Uh, did I mix it up? Let me stop share. Hold on. I want to show the old scan where the baby was cephalic and she had the exact same problem last time. So this is something they describe as anterior incarceration. We've seen the other one where 
the uterus gets entrapped posteriorly. So this was her previous pregnancy where the baby is cephalic and had the exact same problem. Um, the more common one they describe in the literature is the posterior incarceration, where if you have a retroflexed uterus or a retroverted uterus to begin with, and the way once the pregnancy starts growing, it just gets entrapped in the sacral promontory and it never flips forward. So other things they say you can have, if you've had previous PID or endometriosis or some kind of uterine anomaly, those are predisposing factors for the posterior incarceration. But this one, they said can happen if you have a very lax anterior abdominal wall and previous C-section scar-related adhesions which tether and pull the uterus forward instead of letting it be neutral. So two pregnancies, she's had the same problem. So she's scheduled- I'm actually like um, surprised they let her- right. like, You know, that, that like she was, she got pregnant again, I guess. Um, right. Right. So this time she's decided she's going to get a hysterectomy. So she's scheduled for one soon. Yeah. The fluid to... also looks kind of low, although- Very low. Both times she had all ago. So it's like, I mean, it's a little more advanced age, but the pockets do look smaller. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this patient had a- stone in their bladder. So I want you guys to tell me the name of this type of stone and anything else you know about it. It looks like a stellate stone. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a star. It's also called a jackstone. I'll show you an example of a jackstone. But it's really cute. Um, and it's actually very specific for a stone that forms primarily like um, in the bladder. So it's not like a stone that passed from the upper tract into the bladder. It, it is a primary bladder stone and it's made of, I'm going to show an article here. So first of all, this is a jack stone. It's a game that children play like jacks. Um, and you try to pick up the jacks while you're bouncing this ball. And so it kind of looks like that. It's got this stellate configuration. Um, this article is about uh, this, this, you know, the rare entity of vesicular calculus. This is all courtesy of my fellow Odessa, who shared this case with us. Um, but it basically, interestingly, it's made out of calcium oxalate dihydrate, which is um, specifically why it makes these kind of radiating spicules. Um, so the, the way that this, this molecule forms is like through these spicules. And um, it's a primary bladder stone. And the main thing is that a dihydrate stone, which is what these are, um, they tend to be, they can be fragmented by lithotripsy more easily than monohydrate stones. So that's one good thing um, that about these jack stones is they can be broken up by lithotripsy and then removed piecemeal through the bladder. Nice. But until Odessa shared this with us, I had not, I did not know that um, these were primary bladder stones, that because of their composition, that's why they make these spicules and that they are amenable to lithotripsy. That's it.